<laughs> hey folks, it's Jeremy. You're listening to Blamo. How do you do? Are we doing okay? Is everyone all right? I always feel like I got to do a little temp check at the beginning of every episode. Even for a bonus episode like this, it's just a little kind of, how we doing? Because I'll be honest, sometimes your boy over here, I'm not doing good. I had a rough day the other day. I want to say uh, thanks to everyone who reached out. Um, look, I'm, I'm going to be okay. I'm always going to be okay. The sun rises again. And uh, hopefully it does for you too. You know, but surprise. We got a big bonus episode. Big old bonus this week with Chase and Quaid of Bezel. They're the co-founders of the Watch Marketplace app and website, Bezel. Has, has anyone used this? Is this new to you? Look, it was a little bit new to me a while ago, but man, it has just basically been a favorite new online hangout of mine. I mean, look, I'm, I'm always kind of on the hunt for a new watch, or sometimes I'll admit it, I'm either selling a watch to buy another one. It may, folks. Like, I'm just, I'm there. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I've really fallen in love with this app. So Chase Pine and Quaid Walker are the founders of the Watch Marketplace app, Bezel. We chat why buying a watch these days has been so hard, why they decided to launch Bezel, dealing with authentication, brands they've changed their opinion on, oh, it gets spicy, the perfect three-watch collection and watch auctions. Dig in, folks. Dig deep. Here we go. Chase and Quaid, how you guys doing? Doing great. Good. Excited to be here. Yeah, having great. I'm, I'm excited this, that this happened. I would say my, my Bezel usage on the app is, is really uh, climbing late at night. It's it's like my new sort of late night app. I just sit and and breeze through stuff, and I'm you know, and like even now, like I'll kind of like go and I like had a little tab open on the side where I'm kind of watching little things that are popping in. What what is it like this for you? I mean, because both of you, you know, you're the co-founders of Bezel, you know, the Watch Marketplace app, and 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 all these other things. How are you guys spending your time on this? It's I mean, it's it's really fun because we got into this because we were obsessed with watches. We had like I don't want to say normal jobs before this, but we we had jobs that were obviously not in the watch industry, and now. It's this really special but also very dangerous opportunity where we're seeing some of the coolest watches we've ever seen every single day coming through the product. And yeah. And so I obsess over it the same way you obsess over it, where I we started this because we love watches. So I'm both, you know, half my day is spent being the person that's helping build the product, but the other half is consuming it. And, you know, we have auctions that are live now. So we're, we're like, we want to bid on the auctions too. Like we want to get involved in the, the whole thing. Yeah, process. are you allowed and to do that? Do you let yourself? <laughs> We have we have a very strict process where if sure. if you want to bid on the auctions, like you have you can't see any of the information about the cost structure on the watches and things like that. So right. so uh some of us have more secrecy than, than others, so we're able <laughs> okay. to do it. But I am point being I am still up late at night, you know, late late or early in the morning looking at watches all day the same way that you are. Yeah. Yeah. And and Chase, what what about you? I mean, we'll, we'll kind of jump into your guys' backstory bit here. So I mean, Chase is just kind of kick it off. Where where did your passion and excitement for watches begin so i it's funny my neither my my mom or dad were watch people whatsoever and when i was about 11 years old for whatever reason or not i certainly caught the bug and i would ask my dad who worked in in century cities close to beverly hills like hey can you bring me home some more watch magazines like next time you know you're over out and about and i would just leaf through anything i could get my hands on and kind of memorize everything i could and i got exposure to brands that were Nothing then that are now really coveted and just a passion that I developed for no good reason uh, or other, other than the fact that I think I was just really enticed by the mechanical nature of these small, tangible things that were able to capture like such an ephemeral concept of time. And so really just took off from there, honestly, and I'm glad it did, but it definitely came out of nowhere. Yeah. And, and Quay, what about you? I think I've always loved watches. It's it's not something I thought about though. Like I I look at old photos and I always had a watch on my wrist and I was like three plus years old. Chase really? and I grew up sur- like we grew up surfing together. And so the watches that I wore were more on the aquatic side. They certainly were not like fine timepieces. They were G Shocks and surf watches from Nixon and things like that. Just oh my to God, Nixon, like dude. tell the time. My first my first watch I ever got because I I continue I think I had a passion for like craft associated with watches mm-hmm. and like the the niceties of them and but I I was born and bred in the in the Nixon world. Yes. Uh, okay. And so my my I think it was like I want to say maybe middle school graduation or something I asked for I think it was a Nixon player like it was the it was like the one automatic watch they had that had like a little tiny diamond I don't know it was like the coolest oh, yeah, thing yeah, ever. Yeah, yeah, I just looked it up yeah. right now. I know exactly and what that, you're talking about. Yeah. That was the first like permutation of of watches for me and then 
obviously, like as I graduated college and I got a real job, but like my first bonus went towards buying a Rolex and I just, you know, I fell head first from there and kind of never looked back. Yeah. To to take a second to just stop and appreciate Nixon. I, yeah. I want to say if if you were, you know, okay, so I was born in the mid eighties. Uh, I'm 38 now. And I got into, you know, watches a lot of times. And I've done like press and articles where it's like, oh, my grandpa, you know, he had, you know, this is, I still keep it at my desk, this kind of like Casio little digital yeah. thing. And, awesome. um, but for me, I was so into skateboarding and I remember it was, was it Bob Burnquist or someone? I don't, I'm trying to, yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Chase is nodding his head where it's like, yeah, but I think Bob Burnquist had a Nixon sticker on his helmet and he, and I remember being like, that's a watch. And, and yeah. I remember, I think I got a Nixon watch. It was a plastic well, a uh, you know, polyurethane, whatever. It was like a rubberized all-in-one watch. And I think I got it at like TJ Maxx or something like that. And it was like 35 bucks, but it was fucking awesome. And then Diesel had watches. and Because uh, I think a lot of people forget to just zoom out for one moment that most people get into watches on the fashion side. Like, uh, yes, you're going to, you know, it, you might get into it from a utility, utility mindset, but most of the time we're getting into watches because it's an accessory or some other way that we can like explore our identity, which is great because it only gets obviously way worse, you know, as, as you get into it. But I do think Nixon, it was so far ahead of its time, like Nixon and Oakley. And those are watches that you can still find that are, you know, totally relatively inexpensive, but that's great that you got into it for that versus like, well, I needed a, a Patek Calatrava and that was the only way to start, you know, cause I think people sometimes get intimidated by watches in general where it's like, great the only way for me to be in this club is to like spend 10 grand you know i think it's it's super interesting too because it's similar to chase like my parents didn't collect watches and it's almost the most visceral like utilitarian tool watch of, yeah. of like my childhood was these like nixon surf watches and yes. beach watch. i think it was like a <laughs> it was like a freestyle shark i don't know if you remember those but yeah yeah, like yeah they yeah. were super <laughs> bright color it was literally like a competition for who could wear the most awful colored watch at the beach but you were like in the sun and it was i don't know it was a cool thing so i think it's funny to go full circle with that, where I think the way that I like to collect now are a lot of the watches that fundamentally serve the same purposes. Like I bought a lot of Submariners in like my early collecting journey. And it's just, I've never thought about it this way, but it's funny to compare. Like I, I'm solving this, I'm scratching the same itch. I've just evolved a little bit where it's like, instead of buying a rubber Nixon or a freestyle watch, like I'm buying a Submariner so I can still go surfing in it. But, but uh, it's just like that con Nixon did so well, that convergence of, of kind of extreme sports and pop culture and watches. Yeah. Yeah. And so Chase and Quaid, you guys, how long have you known each other? You said you were surfing together when? We've been we've been like best friends since we were in third grade, I would say. We started playing soccer together. But yeah, so it's it's long done. Yeah, we grew up about like a five, ten minute drive from each other, played competitive soccer together. And then once we got our driver's license, we started surfing together every weekend. Um, so definitely a multitude of passions. Saw each other a lot during the week from soccer and then surfing on the weekends and we didn't go to the same school um for middle school or high school but had a bunch of mutual friends and just spent a bunch of time with each other kind of during the, the formative years before we went off to college so you guys go to school you get jobs the jobs are not as what you're envisioning it sounds like i mean if you want to go down the job thing we can but otherwise we can skip over it and get to the fact that you you know both start bezel together kind of walk me through where the idea is to do this because i think a lot of people think it's relatively i'm you know air quoting this word like just easy to like start a company but at the same time to actually do something that is a real thing versus like a podcast for example <laughs> it's a little it's a little more work so well, explain explain the origins here yeah, I think the the only importance of the job thing is like we we always grew up very close to each other, but we're very different from a skill set perspective. Like I went down technology lane, design product lane and spent a lot of time at Google and and Chase went down kind of finance worlds. Okay. And so I think we it's not that we picked the wrong lanes of the jobs. The jobs are great. It was just like I think we always wanted to do something together that felt entrepreneurial because there was a lot of mutual spent respect from each other there. And I think there was just an interest in doing something cooler. The way that Bezel came about, I think was just generally expecting something different in the watch world than what we found as first time watch collectors. And when I say watch collectors, I mean like expensive luxury watch worlds. Okay. I think the expectation going into it, like I said, my first watch I bought 
that felt like a oomph, like a like a whoa, I can't believe I'm spending money on this kind of a moment was was my first bonus at Google. And I think my expectation was I could walk into a Rolex boutique <laughs> and buy the watch. That didn't work out. I was thrown in the secondary watch market. And there, I think my expectation was these are such these are such expensive, like high quality items. There has to be a product out there that feels trusted. It feels like there's a technology platform that supports it. I was kind of born and bred on like the StockX and GOAT of the world. Like I, I yeah. was collecting sneakers. I just like expected that for watches. In reality, I was shopping the seller and I was doing the research and I was reading horror stories and I was absolutely petrified to spend whatever it was, $15,000 on the internet. So I think Chase has always been in my entire life the person whenever I have an idea to work on something, I call Chase and Chase tells me I'm an idiot. Oh, and nice. There you go. This is, he's a good friend. This is the first time where I think I get, he was the first call as soon as I was thinking about it. And it was a very different response. Like he, he just got down to brass tacks and we took it very seriously. So yeah, I think that's kind of what kicked it off. And then we started jamming from there. I think to your point of starting something being hard, we probably spent, I don't know if you remember Chase, like maybe like a year or so going through the like, who are we to think that we can do this moment? Like, like, are we qualified to do this? Like, do we feel comfortable doing this? Like, how do we, because we had the technology background, we had like the operational background, but it was the watch kind of credibility that needed to be built out. And a lot of research had to be done, but it took us a, a while to mull it over. And then finally, we just kind of made the leap. Yeah, I think we, we spent a lot of time being like, we've got to be missing something like there there has to be something out there that is this or that solves this problem that we're feeling and like we just somehow haven't found it yet and then yeah after months and months of research and interviews with people in the watch space interviews with people outside of the watch space and tangential businesses we just started to realize like wow i think that this could potentially be a really big idea that solves a problem that a lot of people have and we haven't found that answer and we've been looking really hard um and then i think it became okay do we have the skill set to be able to execute on it. And mm. obviously that digging was important too, to feel like, are, are we the right people to solve this problem? Um, and, and obviously worth noting our third co-founder, Daryl Johnson, who's our CTO, um, like really leads the entire technical front. And so we figured, okay, with, with this team, I think we understand the problem. We figured out that it is a bigger one than we thought. And I think with, with this team to start, we can build a team that can do it. Yeah. I, I mean, I think to, for watches, like, like any sort of luxury item or even just like technological marvel, right? Um, there's quite the barrier of entry in terms of just the relationships required. And I think I've seen other companies and, and a, a very, very difficult part is trying to establish credibility in the marketplace and in the watch world. Because unfortunately, like anything else where it's small and sort of somewhat controlled for, for lack of better term, there is a barrier of entry. And so I think there's a lot of people who are smart and excited and, and have a passion. But I do think one of the things that you guys have also is the relationships. And, and it's not because of where you worked. I want to be very clear. This isn't like, oh, be, you know, if you come from this background, you get this sort of thing. There's, there's a certain sort of like, you know, as you guys were exploring this passion, you know, were you, were you digging around? It sounds like you were doing a lot of other research, interviewing other people. You know, and obviously this wasn't like, hey, watches are something that we could, you know, was a marketplace we could crack. It's like you actually care about this, you know, were, did any of you have experience? Because it sounds like earlier, Quay, when you were saying you, you go into a store and you want to get a watch and it's not the kind of experience, you know, not to shit on anyone, but like it's not the experience you want um, was how much of that sort of let down, not to put words in your mouth, informed the desire of bezel. I think it was a bit of a combination of the feeling of not finding what I want at retail and being pushed to the secondary market. Right. But to me, it was more of the feeling of being so lost trying to find what I wanted, even after I swallowed the pill that I would have to pay a premium for it. Right. Mm. Like, okay. I was on the secondary watch market on various sites, platforms, shops, like doing my due diligence trying to find the watch that I wanted. I was comfortable with the price. There's just like this underlying concern that I'm going to get screwed over. And <laughs> yeah, I, sure. I'm, I, I, who was I? Like, I, I didn't know what an inauthentic example of a Submariner was. Like, I just knew that they were like a heavily faked watch that had a lot of issues. I didn't like, I couldn't have told you what the difference between a 14060 and like a modern sub was. I just like, mm -hmm. I, I didn't know anything. I was so green. Right. And I think, 
our bet in starting the business and and the continuation of that feeling was there's a lot of these first time watch buyers out there that don't get the love and care that I would hope they would. Mm -hmm. And the whales out there get a lot of the attention, but like those whales had to be a first time watch buyer at some time. Yeah, exactly. And so our bet is if we can build this safe little watch hug around finding your first watch, then could we also build the best experience from an inventory perspective around scaling out your collection as you continue to grow, right? And so like that's what we obsessed with and building the credibility there was was not easy in the beginning. I think we we're at the stage now we're kind of like on the other side of the hump where mm-hmm. I will openly say I think one of our superpowers in this industry is that we did not come from this industry. Like I we're able to empathize with the the folks that are actually the bread and butter collectors for a lot of these big marketplaces like ourselves. But at the same time, we were able to whether it was through kind of the investment arm and getting folks on the cap table that you know, we're legends in the watch industry, or whether that was our first hire, Ryan Chong, was, you know, one of the heads of private sales at, at Sotheby's and, and has a massively credible resume and watches and just kind of a, a, a general savant in the space. I think our job was to not lose the ethos of being collectors ourselves and feeling the pain points, but also building out the team and the credibility to be able to, you know, actualize that vision. Yeah, I think part of the the most fun conversations we have is when we're all in the room and we've got people from finance, ops, design, technology, and the watch world, right? Represented by Ryan, he's built out a really awesome authentication team mm-hmm. under him. And I think when you have all those different stakeholders in a room, you come up with with initiatives that are much more creative than if any one of those stakeholders ever kind of like just sat down, put pen to paper, be like, okay, what problems do we need to solve? So I think it's really, like Quaid said, part of the superpower is we come from outside of it, but we have enough understanding of it. And we have people on the team that have come from within it that we can all get together and create some really creative friction that ends up resulting in things that we think can't and really won't be built anywhere else. So who had the brilliant idea of not carrying inventory? It's it's kind of a combination, I think, of all of us. So no one can claim that. And the funniest part about that, and Chase and I love to tell this story, we raised our first round in August of 21. Yeah. And so this is like, you know, ha, three ha. to five years of bull market. <laughs> yeah. Like, it, it, it was fundamentally the best time you could have ever raised a seed in a really long time. So we benefited from that massively. But yeah. At the same time, the dynamics of the watch world were very different than what they are today. Yeah. Where 150K like, we getting... Nautilus, 200, yeah. 300. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. It, and the <laughs> dynamic was, you know, you buy a watch, you sell it for more tomorrow. Yeah. And so if you look at like what our competitors were doing at that period of time, a lot of them pivoted to the like, let's take on more inventory, let's optimize margin here. We got like made fun of by a lot of the investors in the early days because they were like, why don't you just take inventory? Like you should take inventory. Like you're leaving margin on the like on the table. That's irresponsible. And I think there was two reasons for that. One was like dollars make sense, like make more money. The second was how are you going to offer a high quality experience and compete with inventory sellers if you don't have the inventory? Like there's no way you're going to win that game. Our bet always was... I don't know. One sounds risky. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're not. We'll figure out. I'm happy to be wrong about that and we'll strap on inventory later. But the second was I, I, our bet was we could probably build technology and like operational processes around making it feel like we can offer the same service as if we bought the watch we had it on stock. Like we could do really cool stuff to like handhold, make the, the experience feel expedited, like whatever we needed to do there. And so that was our bet. And it obviously we were we were right about the former one that like, <laughs> you know, the the market swayed. We saw that tank. Yeah. Down, you know, top models down, whatever, 40%. And we were very lucky that we didn't have to take a haircut on any inventory that we took because we didn't have any inventory. But I would love to say it was some like, you know, genie in the bottle strategy that we thought like, oh, the market's going to be down. Like we're going to come out on top here. I think it was just like fundamentally made more sense from a business perspective. And we were super inspired by, you know, the stock X's and the goats in other verticals. And we thought, you know, why not apply that same model to watches? Yeah, I think. Part of it, too, is that even from the very beginning, we had the understanding that that marketplaces are very valuable business models, right? Like you can do a lot of really interesting, creative things in that context. Um, And then we also, I think, figured out like, were we just going to raise a bunch of money to go buy watches? That doesn't seem (laughs) unique. That doesn't seem like we're changing anything. Like, can we build a process that brings buyers and sellers together in a more creative way that allows people to get liquidity for their watches, allows them to feel trust in the platform because the authentication like 
that just seemed to us, I mean, when you say it out loud, like a much more powerful proposition to anybody in the space than being right. another person to, hey, let's buy a bunch of watches and see if we can sell them. Like it, there just doesn't seem to be any magic there. And and I think everybody from kind of a finance world perspective would say, yeah, like just the the financial wherewithal and the model of a marketplace versus inventory recently, like the the risk you're taking is so much different. And the model you have to build is so much different too. And those marketplaces are much more valuable businesses and they do a lot more for for all stakeholders. Yeah. And I think the other thing that was that's happening outside of you guys starting Bezel at this time, and, and this is as a person who's been buying watches for, you know, 15, whatever years now, um, there isn't really as much of a relationship with an AD anymore. And I say this as a person who has a very long relationship with an AD, but, you know, when I communicate that to other friends of mine, they're like, who the hell are you? Because I think all these new people start to get into watches you try to have the relationship with an AD, like Quay, like you were talking about, and and all of a sudden it's not, you know. And I think there's a weird uh, part of this is almost just like, you know, if you're raised in America, there's a certain level of expectation you have in any sort of service commerce industry where it's like I am the customer, and it's not so much like customer is is always right. It's just like that there you feel that there's this sort of cordial relationship, a rising tide lifts all ships, blah blah blah. But you basically go and you get stonewalled at these ADs. People's idea and, and understanding of what a relationship would be with an AD was so convoluted and so not what 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 it was that they turned to these miniature networks, which weren't miniature at all. That it was Instagram, it was these social networks and things like that. So I think when you guys created this platform, because the one thing that I haven't heard you say yet, which I'm curious about, is the the knowledge aspect of it. Because yes, you had a marketplace, but so did StockX. But there's no, I, I didn't feel that I was learning anything if I'm goofing around on StockX. It's too difficult to find. The watch models aren't really correct. They're, I don't really, with all due respect, I, you know, and they, I think they sunsetted this program. I don't even know. I don't think that they were, they were having very good authentication, you know, on there. And there was no other knowledge. It's like, hey, you like a sub. Have you tried a, a Cartier? Well, whatever it is, right? So I think that there's, there's that sort of stuff in there. So how much of it was a part of your mindset where it's like, hey, we really need to have some sort of like knowledge base, you know, and along with it. Yeah, that, that was super important. I think that one of the things we did very well at the beginning was, and part of this was with the hire of Ryan, is, is know that the founders ourselves, like there was a lot that we didn't know in the space. And if we were mm-hmm. going to become experts and have Bezel be thought of a really expert platform, like a collector's platform, truly, um, that's also like allows those first time watch buyers to become collectors. Like we needed to acquire that knowledge base and we needed to know that there were people out there that knew it way better than we did. Right. And so I think by getting a lot of those people to come work at Bezel, getting a lot of those people to become advisors, investors, et cetera, in Bezel, mm-hmm. I think was a strong point for us to recognize like, okay, we've got so many interesting strengths that seem unique, but we also need to recognize where we need to build up ways to compete with those who are already in the in the watch industry. And so I think having the humility to be willing and curious to learn really helped us get there quickly without coming in with the like kind of know-it-all mentality, like, oh, we're going to be able to build something that everybody loves, like we know what they need. Um, So I think just being willing to listen and understand that there were really awesome experts out there that would be willing to lend a hand to help us create something that everyone probably wanted. Um, So we have a lot of people on the cap table and who we talk to often that are cheering for us because they think it'll make the watch industry better. And I think that was something that was really helpful to understand from the very beginning. I also think like the watch world, and I think there's a few collector communities that are that are like this, but obviously I bias towards watches as being a very unique one in that if you do something that feels disingenuous, it's sniffed out quite quickly. Mm. And we didn't want to feel like we were a marketplace that did something else that that like wanted to strap on watches. Like it needed to feel like the product was tailor fit for watches. The flow was tailor fit for watches right, the authentication okay. process was tailor fit for watches like everything needed to feel very custom and to to like make another comment about the early fundraising days like it was collectibles generally were crazy and we got a lot of feedback which was like okay when are you moving over to purses when are you moving Ooh, over to trading yeah. cards like things like that and i think our answer back was always it's like a massive market it's very sensitive to outsiders that feel like it's not they're not there for the right reason or they're not taking it seriously. And so we wanted to take it very seriously. And we 
we hinged on authentication to to do so and and getting the right people around the table like like Chase mentioned. We also learned very early that, you know, when you say authentication, it doesn't mean that much because so many people say it. And so much of our process meant not talking the talk, but walking the walk and letting people in on what our authentication process was like and talking about the fact that we don't just authenticate these things and we don't just have a team that's built with this degree of experience. We also like, have watchmakers on staff and we run anything di- against diagnostic checks. We run everything. It's like a, a loss registry to make sure it was right after report is stolen. And we actually release our numbers like in... In Q3, we announced that like 23% of the watches that were attempted to be sold through Bezel were, were flagged Oof. and didn't pass the authentication check. So like, that's the scary thing. I think of Chase and I as collectors that started the business, we were scared going into the industry. And then now that we have actual data back in like almost a quarter of the watches that are attempted to be sold with like an average order value of $12,000, I wouldn't feel comfortable giving Chase as like my friend. I would I would say, no, you probably shouldn't want that. You don't want that watch. So like that's the staggering reality of the industry. And to think about the fact that like on other platforms that we would have transacted on as users before Bezel existed, like those would have just largely been passed on to the buyer and the buyer would have maybe never known they would have found right. out later. Like, would they have had recourse? I don't know. And I think that's the scary reality of kind of the industry that we are in right now. Yeah, I mean, because it's all, you know, these aren't, you know, uh, entry level pieces. I mean, there are some watches on your site which are less expensive than others, but I would imagine most of the people that are coming on, there's, you know, it, the, I mean, you guys are selling freaking QPs. I mean, all, all sorts of like heavy stuff on there. So, I mean, having that security is incredibly important. I mean, I... um on the side, and this is like public stuff, like I've, uh, w- as I was getting into watches, I was kind of like this like mini broker between yeah. stuff. And for a while, a lot of the watches that I was helping some folks get were really easy to figure out. And they're like, look, this is real because of A, B, C, and D. And eventually I kind of had to push myself out of it because of how crazy some of these, you know, fakes were happening. I mean, there's even fake pogues, like, yeah. and you know, a a few different well-known watch dealers that I've worked with in the past, it slipped by them, yeah. you know, and to where they were like, whew, like this, why would anyone fake a watch that costs us? But it's like, because there's money to be made. And I think totally. like knowing that there's some form of a security behind it, I think is a, is a huge thing, especially for, I imagine some of your other clients, including people like myself, where it's like, this is a big deal to me. Like, I'm not like a extremely affluent person who can go and do this. Like I'm, I'm rich that I have, you know, clean water and shelter and stuff, but like I have to save for a very long time to get the watch. And so knowing that you throw all that down, like it's, you kind of want some security behind it. Um, totally. yeah. yeah. And it's not just, it's not just fakes either. It's like, it'll be everything on the spectrum from something that's downright fake to, you know, a watch that had been relumed and they didn't mention that or it has re- like a service style and that's not in, that's not included in the listing or a, you're buying a Submariner but you actually couldn't take it in the water because it doesn't pass pressure. Like all of these little nuanced things. We've had watches that had been re-engraved and the way that we caught it is the papers didn't smell old enough for the age of the watch or Jesus. we've had watches that were in <laughs> high profile samurai sword heists in London and they were actually reported stolen and it was like a $75,000 Nautilus or sorry, Aquanaut, that the buyer would have received it and had no recourse. And it just, you know, maybe an insurance company knocks on their door at some point and says, excuse me, sir, like I need that watch back. And the horror stories are just so scary. And I think the fun part about the industry is we, that we are in is I think everyone is kind of baseline, very apprehensive. And so it allows us this opportunity to just obsess over the handholdy nature of what we are doing and relish in the exciting moments of when we do find something and we get it to them and they're actually like they their guard is lowered. I think those are the moments when you create real customer engagement that you have someone that sticks around for life and keeps collecting and, and things like that. And the craziest thing when we started it, like it's not just like the three of us that have this problem. You know, it, it's not it wasn't just like me who is you know, working some tech job, had made some cash so I could afford watches. But to your point, like, I'm not like an NBA player, you know, like I'm not, I don't, I don't have like a guy for this. Yeah. 
the thing that was shocking for us is through this experience, we've been able to connect, whether on the investment side or the client side, with like a lot of high profile individuals, and they all have the same problem. Like they're all scared about where they're buying from. A lot of them are still shopping on marketplaces and things like that. It's not like they have like the plug. A lot of them still can't get access to, you know, the latest APs and Patex. Like they still sit on wait lists and they can't get these things. So like it's a crazy industry in that like the highest of the high end clients all the way to the first time watch buyers, like all experience kind of a lot of the similar problems. And it's funny because no matter who you are, like the vast majority of our buyers, like other than perhaps a house or a car, it's the most money you've ever spent on anything, right? Yeah. And then add add on to that, like we're trying to convince you to do it online, right? And so I think <laughs> a lot of it's like, that's why the watch industry has had such an issue coming online. But we, but a lot of people were thinking like, ah, oh, just people are never gonna gonna buy luxury online. And then we kind of try to double click on that. It's like, well, well, why is that? And I think what we found is the biggest reason for that is because of the trust issue, right? Like you have to get it in person. You have to figure out who you're dealing with to be able to have the trust, mm-hmm. and that's why they can't move online. So what we we're thinking is like, okay, hold on, like why instead of just looking at the symptoms, let's look at the root cause. Like if we can solve trust, can we move more and more of these? purchases online because that's that's the gating factor right it's not the fact that like i don't want to click checkout right like i want to have it in my hand the first day it's like shipping's overnight regardless right so i think what we figured out is that trust was really the big barrier and like quade said like everyone was having that same problem and it was an equally large purchase for everyone because it just scales up right like you have cheap watches on the platform you have way more expensive ones on the platform but like no matter who you are, depending on what you're buying, like it's one of the biggest purchases you'll ever make. And so like, how can we solve that problem for everybody? Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's a huge point. I mean, when I think of it, yeah, you're right. I don't, a house and a car and that's, I haven't bought anything else this expensive, which is embarrassing, but it's also, yeah, I mean, sure. It's true. Um, the, the you know, I'm, I'm curious, how did you handle some of these issues in which, because I'm going to kind of make up a scenario. So you got Joe Schmo, he buys, I don't know, a Royal Oak and the Royal Oak is hot. And then he, so now you have an issue with the buyer and the seller. How do you guys handle this? This was our biggest concern in August of 21 when Chase and I were like confidently out pitching this business and and acquiring, you know, the, the funding we needed to launch this. But because Like our bet was that we could protect buyers and we felt really good about building authentication team and catching these things. Yeah. I was candidly more concerned once we did that, like it's still a bummer of an experience. Like I, I wanted to buy this 15202. I had a wedding coming up. Yep. If any buy, if a buyer's like anything like I am as a buyer, as soon as I click purchase, I'm like staring out my window waiting for FedEx to show up with the watch. Oh yeah. I can't wait to put it on my wrist. Like I'm very excited. And so it sucks if, you know, you, it takes a day for the watch to get to us. We authenticate it during that next day. And then you get a call from us saying, hey, you know, the watch came through, but it didn't pass because of blah, 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 blah. Like what we're doing right now is like, we're going to avoid the sale. The watch is going back to the seller and you have a choice as a buyer. We can immediately return the funds back to you or we could go source you oh. an, like an example of the same quality or better for the, you know, the same price or better, right? And our bet was like, we hope people would do that. But I don't know, it's still a bummer of an experience. And in reality, like a insane majority of the customers that experience that situation will have us just replace it with a, a better example. And the delay is typically 24 or 48 hours for them getting their watch. But they get to experience that like very visceral feeling of, Wow, like you have like it makes sense that you exist. Like you protected me once from this watch. I trust you now. You're not going to do this again. You're not just trying to push a sale through. We're very upfront about why it doesn't pass. Like we'll show them the details and the imagery and everything around it so they can see yeah. like the almost like the provenance of the sale on some degree. And then uh, a lot of buyers end up just, you know, repurchasing something else and we get it to them and we do our best to get it them as quickly as we possibly can. Yeah, the the good news is that I think those buyers more than anyone else will then never buy a watch anywhere other than bezel, right? Like they get the most under the hood understanding of like the value proposition, right? It's like, wow, if, if I bought this watch anywhere else, I'd probably have a fake Royal Oak and I wouldn't even know it until I went to sell it in 10 years, right? And so I think that's a huge, what we thought, what we were really scared of ends up being a huge plus to really user educate of like why we're different. So this is a weird question. But like that to me is a much stronger selling point than anything else that you guys do. So how do you advertise that on a business side? Because you don't really want to like shit on people and you don't really want to scare people. 
But like that thing right there, I mean, as a person who spent tons of time on your site and stuff, I don't know if I knew that, like that full. Yeah. yeah. I think it's it's like candidly, like we're trying to get really good at it. Right. Right. So okay. <laughs> we've had a, we've had a year of, you know, a, a year and a half of operating, but like really, really announced ourselves like seriously in January of 23. Right. It was kind of when we did like a bunch of press to announce ourselves existing. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of going back to what I was saying, where it's it's walking the walk. It's not just talking the talk. Mm-hmm. It's trying to be transparent about revealing our numbers that like 23% rate of, of like how often these rejections happen. We don't want to scare the fun out of it from right. people. Yeah. But I, but like, frankly, and I feel like this is a powerful statement and I don't mean it flippantly. Like I wouldn't buy anywhere else as a collector. Like I, I, it, th- this experience just like rattled me to my core where I recognize, I think the industry's outlook is still very... Like the buyer will never know. And mm-hmm. like, if they never know, who cares? Like they're happy they got their watch. But I think now there's enough information out there where buyers do know and buyers like know that there's that risk. So it, it sucks to get something and see something slightly off about it. And then it just stales the fact that you just spent, you know, a lot of money on something that you were really excited about. So I think our job is to get really good at, you know, explaining the process talking about the way the flow works and like being very transparent as we continue to grow. Have any of you like, you know, just in your friend group or whatever, uh, ever had a buddy who had a fake and you had to kind of figure out how to tell him or, or if you did or not, We've I think had, like, like that's an honest question. Like that, that a lot of people experience is like, I have a friend who's, I'm sure he's listening to this pod. He has a watch. It is 100% fake and yep. he doesn't know it. And I don't know how to tell him. We've had a lot of like, we're in investor meetups or things like that, like events hosted by our investors. And we're talking to some guy that's a friend of the investor. Oh boy. And he's, he's wearing a, Meal. you know, a steel bezel Daytona or whatever it is. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. it just doesn't look right. And he's talking about where he got it. And the whole time we're just like, me and Chase are just kind of like laughing to each other a little bit. Like, I don't know if we say anything to this man. Yeah, I don't know him. Of course like, not. But you know, it is what it is. And, and, and like, we've learned how to respond. I think in those scenarios, I think in the beginning we were just like, at least me, I, I, I guess I was like just not playing the room where I was just talking heavily about the 23% number. And like, if you get it at the wrong place, it's a very high chance to mm-hmm. scare, scare, scare tactic. And you just watch him like the color drain from his face and he panics. Whereas I think now we've learned to bite our tongue a bit more and just talk about like how we like to source watches and how we like to do it intentionally. And if they want to be a customer going forward, they will be. But our job is to not sour the watch that they already have yeah yeah we, we get a lot of it it's funny because we're, we're obviously not in the weeds on the authentication team and like we're, right. we're at these meetups and people say well, well does this does this look good i got it from xyz thing and i actually didn't really know the person and like we have to very much take the like I, i'm not sure it, it it might be it might not you shouldn't ask me that right now you should figure that out for yourself <laughs> if that's something that you're worried about i can tell you what we do and like why i personally buy watches on bezel but like i don't want to like be the arbiter of your watch right now um and so i think yeah it's it's all about people people are going to collect however they want to collect and i think our goal is to provide people with the most information they can possibly have and then they can make their decisions um so yeah it's always a fine line to to toe we do get the like those conversations though where it'll be like yeah i bought this from so and so on the street in new york and and like we'll just be like i don't i hate that context like it doesn't it doesn't feel right like it doesn't yeah. feel good you know i don't i don't feel comfortable that your watch is 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 authentic but you know maybe it is congrats like i don't know it's our, it's not our job to tell you that right now you know i think that's a very that's a very good response because yeah. it, one it no matter who you are and I'll say this, like, it feels good to dunk on other people because we're relatively awful individuals who you want to assert yourself by some sort of knowledge. And I say that as a person who's been there and I've done stupid things, but I think you guys said it really well in the sense that like, look, like, does this make you happy? And I, and by the way, in no way, shape or form am I endorsing buying fake watches. But I think for some people like, you know, cause I'll get DMs all the time. Someone's like, is this Seiko legit or legit check? Is this watch legit? And like most of the times, like I just stopped responding and I'll just be like, are you happy? I'm like, if you're happy, then great. Then it is as real as you want it to be. Uh, don't sell it because, you know, it's special to you, aka it's probably not real. But like, I think that's a thing to really be conscious of. Um, you know, because, uh, you know, who you don't necessarily want to be the arbiter of truth for someone else. You know, but you do want to do your job, at least in your guys' sense, for the platform that you've helped create and launch. Yeah, if they're, if they're a customer, it is our job to be yes. to scrutinize everything. Sure. My 
my I just empathize with the collectors that have watches in the sense that like once you plant that seed of doubt in the watch, like it grows into a really horrible, awful, poisonous tree. Like I in a pre bezel world, I purchased the the black version of the Daytona that you're wearing on your wrist. Yeah on the secondary market from like a very reputable dealer. Sure. And I went to a wedding with it in Vegas and I'm on the dance floor and the, the, like a pin in the bracelet came off and it just unravels itself and falls flat on the dance floor. And like, that's the, the, like the grossest feeling you could ever imagine. And I picked the watch up and there was nothing wrong with the watch, like the something like a, I guess the bracelet was just like poorly resized or whatever it was. Sure. But like, I immediately went into like scrutinized town on this watch. Like I was like, the sub dials don't look right. And like, oh, everything's yeah. wrong. about. And like forever, I sold the watch like a month later. Like I was like, <laughs> I, this watch is forever tarnished. Like, I don't know where I, I just doubted everything about it. Yeah. And I, I was delighted by the watch prior to that. And so like that little seed of something could be wrong is an awful feeling. So, you know, we try to, for our customers, our job is to make sure that never happens to them. And for folks that we meet at meetups, like, you know, we hope they have a great time with their watch. <laughs> Yeah, I it's uh it's real. I mean, a, a, another buddy of mine, he's been he's, you know, makes a lot of money. He has a watch guy. Yeah. And a news article came out that his watch guy had some sus stuff. And so he then is like I'm selling all my collection. And in in this case, he was like I'm getting out of watches altogether. Which that is when like sure it's a funny story blah blah, blah you know, when people are being, being silly, but like when the person basically walks away from something that was their passion is definitely the biggest heartbreak. Is where like, you know, cuz I mean that's not happening with Porsches, right? Like, oh, you bought a fake Porsche. It's like sure maybe it it was a, you know, rebuilt title, but like it's not a you don't really have that concern. Um Yeah, yeah it's yeah. It's interesting. It happens on both sides, right? You have like big collectors who have like a horror story like that and it, it ruined the entire collecting journey for them and they've lost an awesome hobby and passion, right? Yeah. And then on the flip side, you have people who love watches who can't buy one at an AD and their whole life have been too scared to buy one on the secondary market. So they're super passionate about watches and they feel like they can't buy them, right? Which is almost worse. Right. Yeah. And so it's like <laughs> that barrier to entry being so high for something that you love. Like we have buyers on the platform who bought, you know, their first, you know, Omega on bezel and now have spent ungodly sums of money on watches because they're finally like, oh my God, yes, I can like right. act on my passion now because I feel safe. And so yeah, it happens on both sides of the coin. And and the one where it ruins the passion is is really sad because it only takes one and then it ruins it for you forever. And it's yeah, you're right. It's a very unique problem. Yeah. So auctions, that's the thing that you guys just popped up recently. Talk to me about that because I do I do like it a lot in the sense that there's there's stuff that's going for good deals. I mean, I'm watching all of the auctions and it's like it's it's legit. Like it, do you see yourself really kind of straddling both worlds of the auction world and, you know, the authentication marketplace or, you know, what, what's the, what's the plan now? Yeah. I think the reason why we're so excited about it is thinking about it very much as like one holistic product. Okay. And I think both businesses are really exciting in isolation, but when you put them together, I think you get this really exciting unlock both from the buyers and the sellers on the buyer side. It's just fun. Like we're mm -hmm. dropping 21 auctions a week. They all started $500. Most expensive watch we sold in the last month on auction, I think, was $116,000. And cheapest is, you know, sub $2,000. Like, mm -hmm. we have access to cool stuff. It's curated and it's fun and it's exciting. And then it all starts at $500 bids. So you get the ability to, you know, just feel like you're bidding in on uh, the $15,000 GMT that you want, but you're going to get a good price or whatever it is. A lot of the prices have been really attractive and fun for buyers. And then also yeah. some of them, you know, people have gotten lost in the sauce and it's scaled above <laughs> market. And I think that's part of auction buying too. It's fun. Um, the cool part too, from a, from a like understanding of what you're interested in as well, like it allows folks to lob bids on watches and maybe not win the auction, but then we learn kind of where they are interested on in paying for a watch. And we have right. the marketplace inventory to then say, you know, hey, Chase, like we saw that you bid up to $12,000 on this GMT. We have another example that is a similar model that, like you actually might like. And there's a lot of discovery there for the underbidders. So 
huge play connecting the two together. Oh, and then on the genius. sell side, it just offers seven day liquidity for sellers now, which is super valuable. Oftentimes on kind of the individual retail side where, you know, instead of listing it on the marketplace and waiting for the auction to, or sorry, the watch to sell on kind of you know, the marketplace, we now have this option where we can kind of guarantee a sale within seven days if you go to auction. So um, super excited by that. One of the things you had said is that like you're able to reach out to people who had were like an underbid and get a market because I don't, I mean, that's not not something any other auction house can do. I mean, Phillips can't do that. They can't be like, oh, oh, by the way, sorry, you know, we also can get you this. Um, yeah. I think other other auction houses will will reach out to underbidders to try to maybe sell the same model, or if the watch obviously that they're ha- their auctioning off doesn't sell, like they'll reach out to underbidders. I think the unique ability for us is we have such a robust like personalization engine internally that we're able to say, hey, Chase has been browsing on this. Chase has this in his wants. Chase bid on this at this level, like cocktail of information. Here are the best five watches that Chase would really like. And then Chase's concierge representative can reach out to Chase and say, hey, like, saw you were bidding on this. Like, have you thought about these models within that price range of what you bid up to? Like, and we can get really creative about offering, you know, new things for them to discover. So I think that's the fun upside where like, yes, auction drives more sales for us. It creates more liquidity for sellers and like quicker liquidity in the sense that it's seven days, but it also just generally makes the whole platform much smarter. Right, right. Have there been any watch brands or watches that you've gotten to see or interact with more that have really changed, you know, your opinion on them? Like are all of a sudden you guys huge fans of, you know, I don't know, uh, insert the blank watch brand right now because of you get to interact with it more now or what? I think for me, at least it's exposed me to a ton of different brands that I had no idea about. And okay. then we have like the really lucky situation where we're sitting next to like some of the best watch experts in the country who work at Bezel. And so we can pepper them with all these awesome questions right off the bat. So I think there's a lot of brands that I've come to appreciate a ton that I didn't even know about before. Um, like I'm wearing a Ming right now that I've never even heard of that mm-hmm. brand ever. Um, and just being able to learn from from the individuals that we have on staff and on the team just makes everything more exciting. And then there's the obvious point of like so many watches that we sell come in that like we've never been able to see before, right? Like I've loved this watch for right. 10 years and I've never seen one. And then a longa comes in, you're like, oh my gosh, it's, it's even cooler in person than I thought it was going to be, right? So there's a lot of... A lot of moments like that where you've got the team distracted, huddling around one watch that comes in that everybody's really excited to see. So yeah, a lot of fun moments. I think for me, like it, it certainly has, like my collection is scaled more than ever and uh, I it's weirder than ever. And I think that's fun. But I also like to take the inverse of that and I'm not going to name brands, but like there definitely are watches that I thought I would really like that I see now that I'm like, ah, not for me. Like, I don't oh, know. Okay. I don't know if I need that. So, and I think like, because we're seeing so many of them now. We, I mean, there was a period of time where like me and Chase would stop what we were doing and we'd walk over to the authentication room. We would look at everything coming in and now like the volume is so much that like we miss stuff. But mm. there's also like, there's just like watches that that I would I would kind of like meme a little bit and then I would see it and I'm like, do I need this? Like we had a, uh, this happened last week. We had a, a jean bang, like a like a Hublot big oh, yeah, bang, yeah. but but made of denim with like, distressed denim <laughs> strap and i think it's going to auction or something but i was like D- why do i feel I, like i've never owned a hublot but i'm like why do i feel like i i like i have a visceral connection to this watch like i feel like i need this all denim watch for some reason so there's those weird moments where you're like what am i doing right now where you feel like you're like bidding on this thing because it's available and you saw it and it's actually like really hilarious and good oh yeah but um there's obviously also the like pieces and this I think I, I found in my collecting like we get to see like different variations of different models too and like and like the full breadth of it where like I'm wearing a 15300 Royal Oak right now and it's my favorite Royal Oak by a mile and it's like the 39 millimeter with the second hand like mm-hmm. older example or two years or yes almost three three iterations past and I would have ne- I would have literally been like I want the new one like a year ago right, right. And so like this is I've been able to try on like pretty much every permutation of the Royal Oak in the last year that like this one fits my wrist at the 39 millimeters the most I like the sweeping second hand like I like I like this watch a lot and so I went with that one so you know it's it's not just new brands. It's not just picking the brands we don't like anymore, but it's also like zeroing in on the exact version of the model that we think is the best for us. Yeah. I mean, it's strong opinions loosely held is like the best way to be a watch collector because there's so many yeah. watches that I'm like, 
oh man, that brand sucks. I would never own that. And even in my head, like there's, I have text threads with friends where I'm like, no way you ever going to see me wearing this, you know, whatever. And then I'll get to see it. And I'm like, guys, I I kind of feel like I'm really into this. (laughs) And it's, it's, it's obviously the most fun. It's funny. you mentioned Hublot because I think Hublot is a brand that many people love to hate on, even though most people had never even like had it in their hands. If you have a Hublot in your hands, like a big bang, especially the smaller ones, I think they are incredible watches. I am, if I had it, I mean, I don't know. I don't have the money right now, but I would get a Hublot. I think they're dope. And it's funny because people, you, go ahead. Have you seen him? Have you seen him in full denim though? I no, I mean, that's the thing. Now I'm even more get. excited. I'm like, oh, that sounds pretty <laughs> dope. You know, I mean, because there's stuff like that too, especially for independence, you know, yeah. where people like, whether it's, I don't know, like Moser or something like that. There's, there are things there that I don't think images can ever, you know, do it justice when Especially when you talk to other people and they're like, yeah, but man, it's hand engraved and it's, it's put together on this and, and this is all assembled in the fact. Because I think a lot of people like that's like when you hit the higher level of collecting that you start to appreciate parts, <laughs> individual parts that were made, you know, and all of a sudden you want to get them when it's like, why is, you know, someone paying a hundred grand for a time only watch, you know, and I think that's where like passion and marketing and manufacturing and all these things kind of fit together beautifully into where like you really do feel because like what, what is it is it um naoya hita the japanese ones oh yeah the fp yeah. the yeah. fp Jorn of japan that's basically happening beautiful watches they're yeah they are incredible they're super beautiful mark cho uh my buddy has got you know and and i got to see his and i was like okay like i'm in like I, i'm very i'm very intrigued by this um i don't know if i'm ever going to be a person who buys one but who knows you know i, I don't know but like i think there's always that thing, and I'm, you know, I'm curious about it, is other people who are in and around all these watches, like how that might be changing, you know, your own collection and, you know, informing the, the up, you know, upcoming things that you like. So, yeah. It goes to show, and, and you have some amazing watch photographers out there in the yeah. industry doing like beautiful work. And every time you see pretty much any really high quality watch, you're like, oh, wow, actually, like pictures don't even do it half the justice. And and these are given that like some of these watch photographers are just absolute masters of their craft. And you just can't really fully replicate these things without holding it in your hand, which I think is the beauty of it. And that's why you want to wear them, not just look at them online, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it's also like in this time, I think for Chase and I, it's shown like we grew up together. We're very close. We spent an inordinate amount of time together even before starting the business. But now obviously we like, you know, we're, we're constantly speaking to each other. Like our, our collection styles and our interests have diverged so massively despite spending so much time and having the same experiences. Like I feel like I have two buckets of watches. I have like watches that I look forward to wearing and watches that I deeply appreciate. And, but I like feel like I could never wear and like, I just couldn't match with anything. And, and like, it just doesn't make sense to me. And like, there's like, like I think about like a, like a David tune and, and things like that. And like, I, that's not something that I feel like is super wearable for me. Like it just doesn't match my aesthetic. I like things that are very clean and simple and like fashion. I don't know. It just doesn't work for me. Mm-hmm. I'm more of like a classic Rolex, boring AP Patek kind of a me guy. Too. And like chase is like give me the one that looks like it came from another planet like give me that <laughs> so like you got I like an artwork and stuff chase he's like they give love but, those yeah love those. like yeah. and and it's just so funny that like you can see the taste profile deviating so much in what feels like a very niche industry like chase's collection and my collection we can both add five watches this year and like I genuinely wouldn't want to wear any of those of his like <laughs> and it's just so funny to see that come apart you know no there's there's some great banter in the office all all in good fun but, but yeah sure some great uh constructive criticism of each other's uh taste preferences and, and collections which always keeps it exciting so okay that being said i'm sure you guys have done this too what's your three watch collection you want to go first chase yeah sure so i'll start so on on and the reason quay brought this up is my like grail watching if i won the lottery tomorrow i'd buy a, a david thune um db28 xp starry sky which is the tourbillon Wow. Um, which I think is an awesome watch. Um, also, I'm a huge Royal Oak fan. I love the rose gold brown hammered dial tourbillon. That yeah. is like an impossible watch to get to. Um, so I think three watches, if I had those two, I'd have to have one that I could actually like wear every day and like go to the beach in. Um, so on that vein, I'm a huge fan of that. I don't have one and Quaid has one, but uh, Rolex Hulk, I think are like, I think those are iconic. Like, I think you can wear that all day, every day. And it's like, 
it doesn't take itself too seriously. They're so fun. It's like the classic Rolex green color. Uh-huh. Um, so I think that would be a, a pretty cool three watch collection where you got a little bit hard to boil down to three, but I think that would be a, a good one I'd be happy with. Nice. Yeah, I think it's so hard. Three, it's, I feel like four would have been easier, but we'll stick with three. Sure. I I would do a salmon dial white gold 15202. I think like that's like peak, peak Royal Oak. Okay. I like really, really, I like 39 millimeters, but I like really kind of like plain is the wrong word, but like very simple things like that. I would do not the current production example, but the last iteration of the Platinum Daytona. I think like it's yeah. like such a special daily driver, even it's like the heaviest hitting jail driver, but I, I think it's really awesome. And then my heart says a Hulk as well. I own a Hulk. I love it so much. I am the proud owner of we have a really amazing photographer on the team and he said it was the most disgusting watch he's ever photographed (laughs) because I like take the Hulk and I use it. Like I, it's in the ocean every day. Are you serious? Like it's, it is my, I bought the watch being like, this is my, this is my only watch. Like I'm going to wear it like it should be worn. And now it's prohibitively expensive for me to do that. And I've replaced it with some other watches, but like, it's still the vacation watch and you're the coolest part is it looks good when you're out to dinner, but it also looks good when you're like sitting on a beach in the sand. So he made fun of me because it's covered in like salt water and grossness, but I don't know. I think that's very special. If I were to sub it out with like a, a more kind of like aspirational watch, I like group of fours these a lot. So I would get like the, the balance here, the, like the green example with like the kind of asymmetric, Mm-hmm. design i think that watch is incredible but that'd probably be my my three that's really good yeah it's funny i don't think i have a three i don't know i have a bunch of if if i literally told you the truth of what my three watches are they're they're all f- very forgettable i mean i this daytona probably i actually wear this old nomos tangente uh neomatic which is like a really slick watch and i'm like I'm very anti Cartier right now, just because one, because Mike, my buddy, Mike Nouveau is like, just loves Cartier and we both just love to shit on what each other likes. Um, (laughs) And so I'm just like, I'm just done. You know, I I don't think I could ever do that. And like, I don't know. Um, Maybe a Grand Seiko. You you and Mike have the same dynamic that Quaid and I have. Yeah. I mean, we we just, yeah. I mean, and obviously it's all in good fun, but like we, we just, yeah. I mean, we both tell each other that each other's watches sucks, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I don't know. It's like a weird way to like razz someone as an adult when you don't really know any other way to do it. But it, it's it is funny because like I I have these other watches that are obviously totally you know I, I got my dad's watch fixed and it's this really crappy Elgin you know it's a quartz. There's nothing special about it other than that it was my dad's you know and I keep that and that is like the most important watch to me above all. But it is completely worthless. And I think even the movement inside is totally screwed because I've gotten the battery replaced like four times and it just stops working, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And so there's things like that that are special to me. But like, do any, do any of you guys engrave your watches? We, I don't. Uh, Quaid hasn't either. So it's not something that we've done. We have some folks in the office, some who are like deep, deep in the watch world that do really funny engravings on the back of their watches, which I respect a ton. And I think is a really awesome thing to do. I feel like at this stage of my life, I can't swallow the the value degradation that yeah, it would, right? <laughs> would create. But I think it's a really fun thing to do. What, what we do a lot is when people get watches for weddings. Yeah. Um, like the wedding engravings, I think are really, really special. Um, but yeah, I haven't, haven't got there yet. I think like the way that I think about collecting and and I hope none of the authorized dealers in (laughs) my life are hearing this, but like, here we are. Like, I think the way that I think about collecting for most of the watches in my collection is, is, is kind of transient. Like Mm -hmm. I, I wear it with the assumption that I'm probably going to get over it at some point. And then if they stick, they stick. And some of them do, but some of them I'm like, I bought this Royal Oak. I think it's great. I maybe want another Royal Oak, but I always want a Royal Oak in my collection. I don't need like five of them. I I just need one of them, right? Like, and I haven't worked my way up to the Salmon Dial 15202 yet, but I think like once I got that on my collection, I'd probably engrave something about it because I know I'm not going to let go of it, right? Or like, I'm not married. If I got married, I think it's super awesome to have like a symbolic moment in your life where you commemorate that with a watch and you're never going to get rid of it. I've just, I've gotten into watches because I love watches. And the watches, it sounds silly. I don't know. We interviewed Kyle Kuzma as like one of our come collects. And one of the questions that me and Chase so thoughtfully put together in the interview was like, what do these watches mean to you? And I loved his answer because it was like, he was like, I don't fucking know. I just buy watches. Yeah. And I was like, feel you, man. Like, I think that is the that is the way that I think about it too. And so 
I, there's either a watch that'll pop up in my life that that is worthy of engraving and that hasn't happened yet, or it's like one of the big ones that I'm never going to let go of. And maybe I'll engrave something that says like mine on it or whatever. So I'll never let go of it, but hasn't happened yet. As a, as a person who is married, my advice to you, my unsolicited advice is to engrave your wedding ring because I wore a wonderful, uh, I don't know, 16, 610, whatever sub that I had. That was a huge deal for me. Huge deal for me to get. And I had owned an Air King and a Datejust and all these other things. And I had kind of like sold and snowballed them into getting this sub. And I was like, I have this sub. It is the greatest watch. I'm getting married in this. I got married in this watch. P.S. for listeners, when I told my wife that I got this, my, my fiance at the time, she basically threatened to call off the marriage because she was like, how could I ever be getting ready to commit my life to a person who's so stupid with money. And I'm like, oh, cool. <laughs> so, so love you too. Let's, let's get this going. So that watch <laughs> that I wore that was so special on that day, I have no idea where it is because I fucking sold that mm. thing like a year later. And I do think it's true because all of us are like, never, never will I ever sell anything like this. And then some days you're like, you know what? I hate this. I don't know what I'm doing. Why did I ever own it? It was so dumb, you know, and then you just sell it. And I think that's like the best stuff of owning a watch. Like it, it is okay to change your mind, to change your opinion, to do all that. I mean, I hope that people obviously take away with that. And I always try to be as transparent as possible on all the, the exciting opportunities and dumb things I've done to justify. Yeah. Think, Things change. Yeah. I, I I remember I remember owning like a rose gold Daytona being like, this is this is super cool. And then I remember like looking at myself in a mirror one time and being like, what am I? Who am I? What am I doing? Right? Rose this gold me. Daytona? All all rose oh! rose rose dial baguette hour markers. Wow. And I, I, I Why did you like, get rid of it? I because it, it got dis- discontinued and there was an opportunity to like what? get out of it. Okay. But, but also like <laughs> It just didn't, ma- it didn't make, it didn't match, it matched what I wanted myself to be. It didn't match who I was, oh, I guess, if that's the way to bars. think about it. And I think we all, I don't know if we all, I'm, I might be like deflecting, but I feel like we all have this idea of who we can be. And yeah, then we yeah, have yeah. this realization of who we are. And I think that lived in like, I'm going to go to Miami all the time. I'm going to wear unbuttoned shirts. I'm going to wear a lot of <laughs> linen and I'm going to have this watch on. And then I found myself like just wearing sweatshirts and wearing it. And I was like, who is this person? I don't like this person. And I swapped back to what felt safe, but Mm -hmm. so it happens. The (laughs) unfortunate truth, obviously, is that you would never, you would never have to or want to sell it, sell your watch if you had unlimited resources, right? Sure. But unfortunately, oftentimes it's the like trading up into something better or that you like more. So um, yeah, we'd never, we'd never need to sell a watch on bezel if I, you know, had unlimited money. But unfortunately, like the collection has to be curated in a very specific way to to keep uh, keep my rent being paid. So we always got to be ready to to upgrade or downgrade or just figure out how you shuffle it around. Yeah, I do think like that's that's a big value prop that that we wanted to create with bezel though, right? Like if you think about building a collection today, uh-huh. if if I wanted to sell out of my watch before the world of bezel, I kind of would have to take a haircut on it. Like I'd have to go sell it to some dealer that was going to bake in their margin to go flip it to someone else to buy it. So I wasn't getting full market value for it. I was getting some variation of that market value. It was a cocktail of how much margin the dealer made need to make and then how much the dealer thought I would understand the margin and how much they could extract out of that. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. Like, I don't know, you 30% under market, 25% under market, 50. I don't know what the margin is, depends on the dealer and who you are, but like that sucks. And so I think the opportunity that we're creating with Bezel is that if we can really unlock peer to peer where I buy my watch on Bezel or somewhere else, I wear it for a little while. I get to the point where I feel like this is not for me and then I want to sell it. Can I sell it to an actual other individual that's going to pay me market for it. So I'm getting the most value out of that watch. If you create that dynamic, it kind of changes the way that you can collect where yeah. you can have more of this like liquidity driven collection. You can trade in and out. You have more optionality. And so that's kind of the world that Chase and I have been playing in where candidly, we went from, you know, having our very stable, like high paying career jobs prior to this to like founder mode, but we're buying more watches than ever at the same time <laughs> because of both it's a sickness and it's an exposure thing, yeah. but like we've been able to sell to other retail folks very easily. And I think that is the future that we want to create for kind of all collectors. Yeah, that's a really good point. If if I if I could get out of because I mean look, there's a for you know, I've sold some watches and made some money off them here and there. 
but I would say the majority of all the watches I've owned in my lifetime, I've probably sold at a loss. Um, and I think that's, you know, pretty true. But if I do think that, you know, knowing the, the liquid value and stuff of, of some of your watches maybe is something that people want and maybe don't because I have a bunch of people, you know, a, a friend of mine, he, get, he gets this watch, he got a Batman or a Batgirl or whatever. And he was like, Kirkland, dude, you're an idiot. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, what's going on? You know, it literally just texts me, you're an idiot. And I'm like, okay. And I'm like, hey, wh- wh- what's happening? He's like, well, according, you know, to, you know, podcasts and other stuff I've listened to, this this Batman that I bought should be worth 50 grand now. And I'm like, excuse me? And he basically bought it with the mindset of thinking that, you know, the value of watches were going up X percent every month. And so he's, I think he paid like 25 or 30 grand for his Batman. Oof. Uh, you know, I mean, that, that's, that's the way it works. There's, you know, have you ever heard of the stock market? People did that with all sorts of things. You know, it, it's not that novel, but I'm like, dude, first off, you got into it for the wrong reason. I mean, I'll be the guy to say it. I was like, if, if you really thought you were going to just make it, I was like, if you're happy, if it works, then who cares? Or, or sell it in 30 years and then you'll get all that money back. Like, just chill. Um, yeah. 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 Whenever whenever we get the question about like, oh, do you think it's going to go up in value or do you think it's a great deal? Like, it, it's it's very reminiscent of your, of your like, does it make you happy, right? It's like, yeah. are you buying it because you love it? Because if so, like, you're never going to get a bad deal. Um, if you're buying it for other reasons, then you might. <laughs> yeah. And there, I mean, there's like, there's so many people that, that probably made a lot of really good buys intentionally as investments and sure. it worked out for them and it's awesome. But it's the same, like, it's, I love your comment of like, you can't just have your cake and eat it too and like only get the upside. Like, Think about how many people that miss time in the market and just get cooked on other rationalized investments, right? Yeah. Like, and so to without saying too much, we are we have an internal price engine that like has all of the underlying mechanics of what you're describing. So like we know the value of every single watch based on like market data as well as like our sales data. Mm-hmm. And the cool thing about our sales data is obviously we we know like where the sale actually converts. We know where the offers are coming in. We know where the demand is. Like we have a lot of really amazing data there. So. We are are certainly you know very interested in releasing the the type of product that you're describing there. Where you can track your collection. It's just something that like to go full circle with it. We go back and forth on like should we show the retail price of the watch? Like is that important information or does that make you feel sad when you're paying a premium on it? But it also makes you yeah. feel great when you're buying something and it's under retail. But then are we being selective with the information and that feels disingenuous, right? Like yeah. So I think our job is to convey everything and be impartial to it and be a source of truth. And then we have a person on our team that knows your name, that's ready to talk to you and and be one part watch therapist, one part watch advisor. But we're never <laughs> there to say, like, this is an investment or not. Our job is to say, if you're about to buy a certain watch and the market's been going down, we should tell you that. We shouldn't say, that means you're buying the dip or you shouldn't buy or whatever, but we should just give you this information, right? So oh, wow. we just try to be as unbiased as possible. You said watch therapist. I think that's really important to call because like how many times are you like you're talking to someone and eventually it's like hey man maybe you just got to go tell your dad you're sorry like i don't know if this <laughs> i don't know if this it's watch like, is gonna fix it buddy <laughs> it's less of it's less of like what are you running from i think that's more of what the main therapist's job is to do we don't we don't work with other therapists we're not in network but <laughs> right. we we our job is to oftentimes hear out the I've been working with the same AD for years and I've spent X thousands of dollars in jewelry and they're not going to get this for me and I'm so over it and like I have a wedding come up and I and like our job is to just like Sorry. hear that out and and like yeah. be a shoulder to cry on and do everything we can to make the situation better and pop some champagne bottles and make them feel good, right? So um, it's more that than, than what are you running from? <laughs> That's, uh, I mean, it's so true. I think especially with like, you know, um, the, the caliber of individual, uh, I remember, so I, I worked for the armory for a long time and we had opened the store in the U uh, in the U S and I remember, you know, before that we worked in the Hong Kong store and in the, you know, seeing the relationship of how sort of the American consumer function versus the traditional Hong Kong consumer, you know, I realized so much that, uh, especially of like an affluent individual, one of the worst things you could ever do to a wealthy individual was tell them no. And I'm not uh, defending this. I'm just saying like this was something that I saw when people would come in and they would want, you know, a suit in a certain amount of time or whatever. And it, and it wasn't like, no, you weren't good enough. It was like, no, it wasn't possible. As like a, a hand was making this garment. You know, we were like, sorry, we can't get it to you in like 24 hours. But 
seeing the reaction of some of these individuals who were told no in a world where they probably didn't hear it as often as others was really eye opening. And I'm, you know, I'm curious, like, have you had to deal with some of these sort of like client management things where someone's like, okay, cool. You didn't find, you know, I wanted to get X watch fine. I'm going to let the money that I have with you go into something else. Like, you know, how much sort of white glove experience do you have to kind of put into that? The answer is as much white glove as possible. I think right. the really important thing that I think the, guys, the the individuals on our concierge team do incredibly well is like, we need to set expectations, right? Like, and that's, I think what you were referencing there kind of with, with your anecdote where there's, there's a difference between like, Hey, I'm not going to do this for you versus like, this is impossible. Let's try <laughs> to find a solution. Yeah. Right. And so I think setting expectations of, of what's possible is the most important thing. Cause if you're both on the same page after that, then you're working together to find something you want to sell, whatever you wanted to sell, right? Like then you're on the same team. Uh-huh. If you're coming at it from with unrealistic expectations, like there's there's no way that you're going to be happy. So I think our concierge team does a really amazing job of making sure you have, like Quaid said, like we're going to give you all the information so that we can make sure you understand what the reality is and right. now let's work together to to do something awesome. Um, but yeah, if you can't get to that starting point of, of hey, I, I'm realistic, then it's going to be a tough slog. Yeah. It's also different depending on the watch you're looking for. Like if you're looking for something in the modern realm, we actually have a lot of luxury there where our most of our customers are coming in and they either know that that there's a n year wait list for this Rolex they want, or yeah. they just experience that and <laughs> they're really bummed. And so, for the majority of these modern pieces, like we have access to them and we can get it like very, very quickly to the point that the conversation becomes less about timing and more about like what's the delta in price and why am I paying for this premium and does this make sense? But like access is there. So if you have the customer that you're talking about that is hyper wealthy, they just stepped off their yacht, they walked into their local AD. And they're told five years, regardless of their wealth, then we tend to make those people very happy because we're able to say, like, I'm so sorry that happened to you. Like, we'll get it to you in 24 hours. Like, how does that sound? And they're very excited, right? I think for the watches that are neo vintage, vintage, super rare, very, very high end, like it's a different experience where it's then it's the, to Chase's point, being very transparent about like, we're constantly searching for this. Like, it's Mm. the thrill of the chase. It's the, like we have cu- we have customers that will want like a specific birth year like on the papers but not necessarily from when the watch was born like there's a lot of these interesting requests and for those ones it's just about you know keeping people updated on how the timeline is looking and where we're looking and how hard we're looking for this and then making it feel really really special when we find it like we had a buyer recently that wanted a very specific 6265 they wanted it like a very specific condition. They wanted it full set. Like they wanted to feel very good about it. Mm-hmm. And, and when I say very specific condition, I mean like honest, like it look like it's in good condition in a way that doesn't make you like raise your eyebrows. Yeah. And it took a long time to find and search and things like that. But then that makes, as long as they didn't feel like we forgot about it, like it kind of just the, the amount of time it took was because we were scrutinizing it. It's because we were spending time and we looked at five other examples before we found the one that we ended up going with. And that's when you like send the bottle of wine with the watch and you, you get them a reservation at their favorite restaurant and like you make a whole thing out of it. And so you've that's done the that? fun part. Yeah, we, I think our job with with clients is to like do the unexpected, right? And so that's the fun part. We sell very expensive items. We recognize that like a lot of the experience in, in other places is, and other places being authorized dealers is like, are you going to buy it or not? Like you yeah. have this many minutes, like be fast about it. I think our job is to kind of what you were saying in the beginning, how do we apply this like customer is always right, luxury bottle the champagne to a digital product and kind of meet in the middle. And sometimes that means, you know, going above and beyond to do something very special for customers. We partner with like amazing brands that make this easy. We partner with vineyards. We partner with other cool places that, you know, allow us access to these awesome experiences for our customers. And our job is to just delight them if, as much as we can. I mean, that's a huge thing to call out because I, you know, I have gotten stuff and you're like, oh, cool. I just spent this much for it. Here it is. And it's not, you know, it's, I don't know that the product is exciting, but I think the experience is also what people sometimes, you know, silently want that don't, uh, don't always communicate, you know? So I think that's important. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, it's to go full circle. If you were talking about, it's oftentimes the third most expensive, if not most expensive thing (laughs) you've ever purchased. (laughs) And 
that's the scary thing is like it goes hand in hand with the fact that you want to trust it, but you also like want to feel like it's celebratory and it's exciting and it's special because it is very special. And for a lot of folks, they're going to buy this thing and they're going to keep it forever and they're going to wear it every day and they're going to look at it and they're going to smile and they're going to set it to a very specific time like you guys were talking about earlier <laughs> because they obsess over it. Yeah. And if we're if we're not giving it the same degree of care in the sales process, then then we shouldn't be selling it, I think, is the way that we think about it. So we obsess over that as much as we can. Damn bars. Gentlemen, <laughs> thank you very, very, very much for your time. It was uh, it was really, really great to have you on. I'll talk with you soon. Thanks so much for having us. Appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs>